During Epiphany Tide, the events in Scripture that we commemorate are those that reveal the true glory of Christ, those that reveal Him as the Messiah, a person that is both God and man, one who is greater than any other king, prophet, or priest. To help us see this, in today's Gospel, we are first given a picture of Jesus descending from a mountain, where upon arriving at the bottom, he is immediately described as directly healing the leper by his own word and power. Now for an Israelite, seeing this vision of a renowned prophet descending from a mountaintop would immediately bring to mind a Moses-type prophet and leader, as when Moses descended from Mount Sinai to bring the law. However, Moses could not heal. For example, when his sister Miriam was afflicted with leprosy, the book of Numbers tells us that all Moses could do was cry out to the Lord, saying, God, please heal her, please. Likewise, the book of Second Kings tells us of another account, where a commander of the Syrian army comes to the king of Israel asking to be cured of leprosy because he had heard from an Israelite servant this could happen in her homeland. But the king's response to this request is, Am I God, killing and giving life, that this man expects me to cure him of his skin disease? The great prophet Elijah heard of these troubles and he was able to help the Syrian by directing him to bathe seven times in the river Jordan so that God's healing waters would cleanse him of this disease. Thus, in this brief encounter where Jesus heals a leper by his own word and direct power, we can see that Jesus is greater than both Israel's most venerated leader or lawgiver and its greatest prophet. And as the Israelite king prophetically uttered, such healing power belongs only to God. Interestingly, though, today's gospel lesson is not the Book of Common Prayer's original selection. It was changed in the 1945 edition. Before that, all previous versions included a reading from a little later in this same chapter, picking up at verse 23. And this account has been moved to our evening prayer lesson for tonight. But this lesson reads, And behold, a violent storm arose on the sea, so that the ship was being covered with the waves. But Jesus was asleep. So the disciples came and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to die. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Most Christians are probably aware of Jesus' miracle that involved the calming of the sea, or even more so, the miracle of him walking on the water to Peter. But apart from what amounts to a display of power in either of these seascaped events that could show Jesus to be the Messiah, one question we can definitely ask about all of this, or really anything that Christ did, is why? Why did he calm storms and walk on water? Why not calm an earthquake or volcano? Why not walk on the clouds or across hot lava? These things might actually have been more spectacular or impressive. That is, if just demonstrating raw power was the goal. Obviously, we could devise or imagine an endless list of other options, as people tend to do, not unlike the child advising their parents about what is best. People always want to suggest to God what he should be doing. But if we look to Scripture, the first thing we can know with respect to why is that like most things that Christ did, his actions were to either fulfill messianic prophecy or to show that his power and authority were the same as God's divine providence and sovereignty. 
For example, in the book of Job, when Job is describing the power of God to one of his friends, he claims that it is God alone who stretches out the heavens and walks on the waves of the sea. Or when the Psalms sing about God's power, it says, You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. But Jesus did not only calm the waters of the sea, he calmed the wind as well. And all through scripture we can see that when wind is a part of a miraculous event, it is something stirred up and directed by God. So if Jesus can command the wind, he most certainly wields the same power as God. For example, it was God that directed the winds to divide the land from the flood waters for Noah. It was God that used wind to part the Red Sea during the Exodus, and again at the Jordan River when Israel entered the Promised Land. Or when Amos was warning Israel about meeting God's judgment, he wrote, He is here, the one who forms the mountains, creates the winds, and makes the dawn out of darkness. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. So while we can see that Jesus has a power that only God has to command the wind and sea, we can, it, we can still ask, why water? Why involve water when there are plenty of other things that only God can command? But if we continue to look in Scripture, we can see what water represented to Israel and to those that witnessed Jesus' miracles. From the very beginning in Genesis, we see that water and darkness were a formless void and to bring order to creation, God first had to divide the darkness from light and water from land. For the Hebrew, the raging waters and the darkness of its depths were the chaos of a formless creation, the opposite of God's order and light above the waters. It was the home of sea monsters like Leviathan, who was also Satan. And being in the heart of the sea was the same as being in hell and destruction. In fact, in that verse we read in Job, where he describes God as the only one who walks on the sea, a more literal translation of that verse is, He is the one who walks on the back of the sea god, or the one who is Leviathan. The sea is even depicted as the trash heap for our sins. As the prophet Micah wrote, The Lord will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And because the Gentile nations were without the true light of God, they also were related to being overcome by the waters or being part of the chaos and death in the sea. For instance, when Isaiah wrote about God's judgment against the Gentile nations, he wrote, They roar like the roaring of the sea, the raging of the nations. They rage like the rumble of rushing water. But God rebukes them, and they flee far away. The Lord says, Peace to the one who is far or near, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the storm-tossed sea, for it cannot be still and its waters churn up mire and muck, and there is no peace for the wicked. Later, when Satan empowered and sent Rome against Israel, we see this described as, in Revelation as a seven-headed beast coming out of the sea. So when Jesus shows himself to be the one who walks on the back of the sea and pushes back the wind in order to bring calm to the raging waters, he is showing himself to be God and the Messiah by virtue of being the one who conquers Satan, sin, and death, as well as the one who brings peace to the nations, all being represented by the waters. As Isaiah wrote, he stretched out his hand over the sea, he made kingdoms tremble. On that day, the Lord, with his relentless strong sword, will bring judgment on Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, he will slay the monster that is in the sea. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. This is what the Lord says, who makes a way in the sea and a path through raging water. 
God always makes a way, a path for His people. Just like at creation, or just like the Red Sea and the Jordan River, God divides the waters of chaos and darkness to lead His people into a new creation, one of light and order. But God is not content to just have those people who are already on the path. He goes into the waters themselves to rescue more. As the parable of the net in the Gospels reads, The kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected every kind of fish, and when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the worthless ones. In Revelation 10, we see the culmination of Jesus Christ's victory over the waters and how his kingdom unites both Israel and the Gentile nations when it describes Jesus as standing one leg on the sea and one leg on the land, raising his right hand to heaven. The land representing Israel and the sea, the Gentile nations. Christ is standing atop his kingdom as he puts all enemies under his feet swearing an oath to the Ancient of Days as a divine witness to the new creation and the new covenant, a creation and covenant that unites all things in Him. Revelation 15 also shows that those of us in Christ also stand over the sea as part of the heavenly choir. Like Peter, who when he had faith could walk on the water with Christ Those of us who remain faithful can stand above the waters, above Satan and our sins, and in dominion of the nations under Jesus' kingship. While we have peace with our Savior above the waters, it is a peace with God. This peace, though, is not the absence of hostilities. Peace with God means warfare with the enemies of God. Christ made it clear that allegiance to Him meant a sword of division as he divides order from chaos and the wheat from the tares. In a sinful world, some warfare is inescapable. We must therefore pick our enemies, God or sinful man. If a man is at peace with sinful men, he is at war with God. It is God alone who gives peace to his people and who in the end will finally give world peace through his law of faith, mercy, and grace. If I could close with a word of encouragement from that pillar of the church, St. Athanasius the Great, who at one time had to stand against the world in defense of Trinitarianism. He wrote, Worship then the Savior, who is above all and mighty, even God the Word, and condemn those who are being defeated and made to disappear by him. When the sun has come, darkness prevails no longer. Any of it that may be left anywhere is driven away. So also, now that the divine epiphany of the word of God has taken place, the darkness of idols prevails no more, and all parts of the world in every direction are enlightened by his teaching. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now unto him who loves us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings, priests, and prophets unto God and his Father, to him be all glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen.